in the elements of the communion. So when you come forward, here's what I want you to do. If you have a need in your life, I want you to come with a great expectation that Jesus is going to meet your need. Amen. I said, I want you to come with a great expectation that Jesus is going to meet your need. Amen. So I want you, here's what I want you to do. Look beyond the sign to what the sign is pointing to. So look beyond the bread and the wine and look to Jesus. If you're here today and you've never given your heart to Christ, when you come, say, Jesus, I receive your broken body. I receive your shed blood. I want you in my life. If you have not been as close to the Lord lately as you know He wants you, really, this is an opportunity to renew your sacramentum, your oath of allegiance to Jesus. So when you come, humble yourself and say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for not being as close to you as I really want to be in my heart. And I receive you all over again today. Thank you. If you need healing, look beyond the sign and see that on the cross, Jesus died and shed his blood, not only the forgiveness of your sins, but for the healing of your body. Amen. If you need freedom from some oppressive thing the devil's been using you uh, using in your life to keep you pushed down say Jesus thank you for defeating the devil on the cross I receive that victory today and then if you need prayer if you're here and you need prayer for a physical need if you have been discouraged and just want somebody to stand with you after you come through the communion line there'll be people on either side and they'll be ready to pray for you. Matter of fact, you don't have to say a word to them. You just go and they'll know. The Lord will show them and they'll begin to pray for you. If you need to be anointed with oil and prayed over and believe some people to believe God for your physical healing, there'll be people here. Let's just let the Holy Spirit do what he wants to do this morning. Amen? So Kent, lead us. There's joy in the house of the Lord. How Come on, church. Be, how many is glad to be in the house of God today? Amen? Woo! Okay, that sounds, like about, that sounds like about five of you. How many is glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Quiet. 
all across this place and sing all my life. Come on. All my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so first reading this morning comes from the book of Isaiah chapter 40 verses 9 through 11. You who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power and he rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those who have young. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You, you may be seated. God bless you. As a church family, and that's really what we are, we're a family, amen. Some of you are new to the family, welcome. Some of you have been around a long time, welcome. We're a family. And the Bible says that as a family, we are to bear one another's burdens. And that means if you have something that you're going through in your life, you're not alone. The Lord is with you, and we're all with you. Amen? Come on, we're all with you. Christianity is not a solo sport like golf or tennis. It's a team sport. We're all in this thing together. So if you're struggling with something, let us come and help you. So this is the time that we share our joys and our concerns, our burdens. So if there's any way we can pray for you today, you might want to just let us know if there's something we can pray with you about. Yeah, yeah. How many of you have had kids that have gone through things before? Amen. Would you mind, Joet, just to stand and let's gather around her. Honey, where are you at? Go and Stacy and just whoever. Yeah, amen. We're a family. Honey, take this mic and pray for her. Lord, we pray for Misty. Father, you see her, you, lo you know her, you love her. I pray that you would bring her into fellowship with you. Father, I pray you would heal her heart, you would touch her mind. Father, you would go before her. I pray for Joette as she stands with her daughter and for the people that will surround her and encourage her and help this move, Lord. 
And we're just trusting you to do this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All my life you have been so, so good. Every breath that I am able, I will see of the goodness of God. Our life. brother has um, stage three throat cancer, and we're gonna we're gonna pray for healing. His sister has arthritis, did you say, and really, really bad. Father, I pray for our brother. Fernando, we pray for Fernando, Father, for his heart, for his throat, Father, that you would touch him, Father, bring healing to his body. Father, we trust you to do ama amazing things. In the name of Jesus, you would heal him by your power, by your stripes. Be with his sister as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh -huh. We love you. Amen. The Lord can heal you. For now. Amen. Yeah. Praise God. Uh huh. It's told the tumor had gone into the back, and the radiologist said, No, it's in the front, and it's much smaller than they thought. Oh, wow. Amen. Amen. From the back to the front, uh -huh. and it's smaller. Now we're going to pray it out in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, come on, church. Listen. Listen, either this stuff is real or we're wasting our time. That's right. Amen? Yeah. I mean, if we're just here to have a little church service and go home, we, we should just go watch the cowboy game and be real depressed. Amen? <laughs> but I'm telling you, the Lord is a mighty healer. Yeah. He's a mighty healer. Anybody else? Some way we can pray for you. Jeremy? Stand up and tell them how many teenagers have been saved in the last, what, 30 days? In the past three weeks, we've seen 53 students <laughs> say that they're done living in the life that they've been living and they want to make a new step in the right direction with God. They've placed faith in Christ and they're ready to run after him. Church, look at all these kids on Sunday morning in church. Young people, stand up. Let us, let, let us see. Come on, church. Give the Lord a hand. Amen. Amen. Yeah, we see you. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated and behave yourself. Amen. That's good. You're looking good. Somebody else. Yes. Today is Maddie Brimer's 18th birthday. Amen. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Amen. Give the Lord a hand for Maddie. We're going to watch her play Olympic soccer one day. There you go. Anybody else? Yes, thank God for the rain. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so I go for my six-month checkup after I tore my ACL this Thursday, so I'm hoping for good news. Amen. Give us a good report, Lord. Anybody else? This is fun. We're having fun now. Uh huh. Miss Mary. Prayers to my precious niece who is suffering with a heart issue and, and a, a, a family member. Also, she's had a stroke that she didn't even know she had. And uh, she has a lot going on right now. What's her name, Miss Marilyn? Blue Ann. Father, in Jesus' name, touch Luann, encourage her, draw her close to you, and Lord, hear our prayer. Anybody else? Yeah. 
Isn't this good? These young people. Stand up, buddy. You're a handsome dude. Stand up. I used to be handsome like you. Uh, my friend Morgan broke his arm, and he has a flu right now, so he can't really move or do anything. So I just want to pray for him. I'll get prayer for him right now. God, I give thanks for Morgan. I thank you that he's been my best friend ever since I moved here. He's been helping me through all my troubles, and I pray that you help him through his right now. In your name I pray, amen. Have you ever prayed out loud in church? You did good, yes. Miss Judy, how can we pray for you? She had her cancer is is kind of staying like this, but she wants it gone. Amen. Kay Clay. Honey, pray for Kay Clay. Father, we pray for Kay. Father, you love her, you know her, you see her. I pray your blood would flow over her and bring healing to her body, and this cancer would be gone in the name of Jesus. I pray for her family as they're standing by her during this very difficult time. Be with Judy as she upholds her sister. Encourage this family. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and in faith, in faith, not just words, but in faith, let's pray the prayer our Lord taught us to pray. When he said, Amen. You may be seated. Let me talk to you about just a couple of things we've got coming up. Now, I want everybody to lean in and listen. We've got so many things going on at the church that we don't, we, we just can't, we'll be here all day announcing stuff. That's why we put it in the bulletin. Amen. So read the bulletin. But we're kicking off our basic Christianity, Christianity 101 study on Wednesday at 11 o'clock. So I'm going to do it twice on Wednesday because some folks don't want to get out at night and drive. At 11 o'clock in the morning on Wednesday, I'll be in the fellowship hall, and we're just going to open up the Bible, and we're going to see what the Bible teaches about God, about who Jesus is, about who the Holy Spirit is, about what does it mean to be saved. What is sanctification? That's big for us as Wesleyans, as Methodists. So we're going to go all the way through. What about the second coming of Christ? We're going to go all the way through, not in one session, all right? It's going to take us a year to cover all this stuff, and we're going to go slowly, and we're going to answer and ask a lot of questions. So that's Wednesday at 11 o'clock, and then at 6 o'clock right in here in the sanctuary. So I want everybody to come, all right? You come. If, you, if you're not working, you come. You be right here, all right? Then on Thursday, our, uh, is, it, is it the super sassy saints, amen, are going, having their first meeting. We're, we're uh, starting all over again on Thursdays. And so uh, those of you who are super and sassy and you're a saint, you come, all right? And then on, thir on Saturday morning, we have our first fat men only. How many fat men do we have in the room? Faithful, available, and teachable. Faithful, available, and teachable. So we're going to have a men's breakfast. We're going to have a great time of fellowship. Brother Dan is going to bring a devotion. And then we're going to roll up our shirt sleeves. we got a lot of projects we need to do about around here. So guys, come to our first ever Fat Men's Breakfast this Saturday. There's a lot of other stuff going on. We've got adult Bible fellowships, student Bible fellowships, and children Bible fellowships kicking off the first Sunday in October. Just think Sunday school, all right? Think Sunday school on steroids. And they're going to be meeting all over this campus and at Lou's at the Country Club. We're going to have some classes there. And just really everywhere, we're going to have to have them at Starbucks and Whataburger and all over because we don't have enough space. There's a lot of other great things that are happening, some refreshing, some repainting. This parking lot is still supposed to get done real soon. A preschool playground out in the courtyard. A lot of stuff going on. 
because you are faithful to give. So it's offering time. And that's the time we ought to clap. When I say it's offering time, let's clap, all right? Let's practice. It's offering time. Amen. Because God loves what kind of giver? Cheerful giver. A hilarious giver. It means there's joy in giving. And uh, so I want every person who is here and you're a member of this church or this is where you feel like God's bringing you to. Maybe you haven't joined the church, but you feel like this is where God's bringing you to. All of us get the joy of being able to give today. So I want to, Ken, thank you for your check writing music. Uh, there, are two, there are two envelopes. Uh, one of them is blue and the other one is, is white. This is for our regular tithes and offering. And this is for the Nets offering. Now, the Nets offering, our goal is $150,000 by the end of this year. And we're well on our way. And some of you have been faithful to give to this every week. Some people once a month. Some people quarterly. Some of you are waiting until the end of the year. Uh, just pray about what the Lord wants you to give over and above your regular tithe and put it in the blue envelope. And then the white envelope is for our regular giving. So ushers, if you'll come help me, we'll get ready to give. Now, let me say this. If you're here today and you're, you are, you're in need and you don't know how you're even going to, you came by faith on fumes and you really don't know how you're going to have enough gas to get home, and you're in need. When the offering plate comes by, just you just take out what you need, okay? Because it's the Lord's money, and we want you to. We don't want you to worry about how you're going to get home. If you're here, and if you're a single mom, and you don't have enough money to get groceries for your kids this week, when the plate comes by. You just feel free to take out whatever you want because it's the Lord's money and we want to bless you. And if there's not enough money there, then you just come see me after the service and we'll connect you with somebody. We want to be a blessing and we want to be a, a, a source of encouragement and help for you. Just don't take any of the blue envelopes out. Amen. But <laughs> you just take what you need. No one will say anything to you, look at you, mean mug you. We love you and we're glad you're here. Chris Jewell, where are you at, my precious brother? Come up here, would you, Chris? Where are you at? Yeah, come up here, you and Jenny. Jenny, stand up. Let our folks welcome y'all here. Let's welcome this couple. This is Chris and Jenny Jewell. Some of you have heard of Christ for the Nation's Bible Institute in Dallas. How many of you have ever heard of that? Chris was there for years. I taught there for five years, and Chris was there on the staff, and they've recently moved to San Antonio. So I said, why don't you just come out, hang out with us at First Methodist Church. The Lord will bless you. So they're here today. Chris, would you pray the Lord's blessing on this offering? And pray good, all right? Because we need a great offering, so pray good, all right? Thank you so much, Pastor Scott. It's a pleasure to be in the house of the Lord this Sunday morning. And yes, we definitely stand on the word of God that we are the ones that plant the seed and he will bring the harvest. So Lord God, we just thank you that as we have already rejoiced in worship and through the declaration of your word that you are faithful God. And Father, we want to be faithful to you because you have invited us to be partakers in the kingdom, the growth of the kingdom and the growth and the expansion of this church right here, Father. It's a new day, Father. And I sense the excitement I already heard from people that we met. You guys are so friendly here. The excitement that there is in this house. And so far, we rejoice that people will have hearts that are open to give and to sow and to believe you, Father, to make this place a place where people will flock to because they know that Jesus is here. We just thank you, Father, for that, that this city, this surrounding communities will be blessed by this place and be impacted by this place. Father, in, in years to come, the people that had left here and come back to visit will see, wow, this, this place, this community has been transformed by the love of Jesus through the people of Jesus. 
So, Father, we give you all the honor and all the praise for what you are doing right now and for what you will do in the years to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power. If you'll join me in the prayer of thanksgiving found in your bulletin and on the screen. Almighty God, who lives and reigns forever, we give you thanks for all the gifts you have bestowed upon us. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I just got uh, word that Corky and Leanne have rushed out. They got news that uh, Leanne's mother has had a medical uh, crisis. So could we pray for them right now? Jeremy, come up. Pray. Pray for Leanne's mom. Father, we thank you for the faithfulness and sacrifice of Leanne and Corky to this church, Lord. So we thank you for them, and we thank you for her mother, and we just ask right now, Holy Spirit, that you would beat them to her, that you would make your way there first, that you would continue to bring protection and that you would just give wisdom and how to move through this circumstance. And we thank you for her life and we bless her in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. It's time for our first kids church. And uh, so all of our boys and girls, if you're kindergarten through the fifth grade, is that right? Through the fifth grade. How many kindergarten through the fifth grade? Pre-K, if you're pre-K through the fifth grade, all the boys and girls get up and come, come, come. Mom and dad, help us, help us. We're going to dismiss them to be with Pastor Gina and her wonderful team. And we're going to pray over them before they go. Aren't they wonderful? And this group's going to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. Amen. All right. Come on here, buddy. 
All right. Look up at me for just a minute. You're going to have a great time. And uh, it's going to be an exciting time. You're going to learn about the Lord and learn. You're going to sing, and I think they're going to dance and have a great time. So we're not Baptists, so we can dance. That's good about being a Methodist. Amen. It's one of the best things about being a Methodist. We can dance. So let me pray over you, and then you'll be dismissed. Okay, stretch out a hand toward these kids. Father, thank you for every little boy, every little girl. Lord, thank you for Pastor Gina and for the team that's going to be ministering to these kids. Help them have a great time and learn more about your love. We pray this in Jesus' name and everybody said, amen. Have a great time today. God bless you. All right, let's give them a hand as they're leaving. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. All right. Seeing kids in church, isn't it awesome? Oh, my goodness. What a joy. Yeah, my, my spirit's lifted, yeah. Our second reading this morning comes from the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed these ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following the desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace. Expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
thank you for the blood of Jesus. Thank you that you have forgiven us, Lord. Thank you that you have adopted us and you have named us and claimed us and you're not ashamed of us, Lord. And Father, I pray that we would walk through life as trophies of your grace and let the whole world know that you are a God of all power and all might and you are able to go into any circumstance, any situation, any ditch, anywhere we find ourselves and change us forever. And we pray this in the strong, powerful, mighty name above every name. Say the name, church, Jesus. We pray it in Jesus' name and God's people said, amen, amen, amen. Give the Lord a shout of praise, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Take your Bible and turn to God's lost and found department. You know where that is? It's in Luke's gospel, Luke chapter number 15. And let me just say that next Sunday, I want you to bring a Bible and bring a friend because we're going to begin to go verse by verse through the book of Acts. The book of Acts is Luke volume 2. It's the same author. Luke wrote at least two. Some people say that he wrote the book of Hebrews, and it could be true. But he wrote the gospel of Luke, where we are today in the 15th chapter, and then he wrote the book of Acts, and we're titling the series Church on Fire. Amen. John Wesley said, he said, I want to be set on fire so the world will come and watch me burn for Jesus. And so I want you to come and have an anticipation. Let me give you some homework. Begin reading through the book of Acts. You can read it in a week. Matter of fact, I'd like for you to read it every week through this series and let the Spirit of God just instill within you a passion and a hunger for all the Holy Spirit wants to do in your life and in our life collectively as a church. Luke chapter 15, there's a trilogy of lostness. Jesus tells three stories. And I don't think there's another passage in the entire New Testament that shows for us the heart of God for the lost. Luke chapter 15, verse 7, I say to you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner who repents more than over 99 self-righteous church people who feel they have no need to repent. Amen. Amen. Jesus said there's more joy in heaven when one drug addict comes to Jesus than when 99 church people get together and do their church stuff. More joy in heaven. Verse number 10, likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one drug addict who repents. Amen. And then verse number 22. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand. Put shoes on his feet. Bring the fatted calf. Kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead, but now he's alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Lost 
and found. Gina and I have four children, and you've met Madison. Madison and her husband, Dalen, were here ministering during the summer. Dalen is the youth pastor of a great church in Arlington. They have four or 500 teenagers in their youth group, and Maddie is discipling many of those young ladies. She's in seminary about to graduate. That's our youngest, Maddie. Our youngest son's name is Joshua. Joshua is the youth pastor at the second largest Episcopal church in America. God is using him greatly at Church of the Incarnation in Dallas, Texas. Then we have Sarah. She's our firstborn. She's our oldest. And she is the founder of the Montessori School at the diocese in Dallas of the Episcopal Church. Sarah, our oldest, and Maddie, our youngest. And then we have Josh. And they all love the Lord and they all serve the Lord. Then we have another son named Dylan. When Dylan was 13 years old, he said, Mom and Dad, I want to meet with you. I want to talk with you. 13 years old. By far the most brilliant of our kids. Won a scholarship to Columbia University his senior year in high school because of a paper that he wrote that was the number one journalism paper in, among high school students in the state of Texas. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant kid. When he was 13, he said, I want to meet with you. And so we went to Starbucks and we were having coffee. And Dylan said, Mom and Dad, there are two things I want you to know about me. Number one, he said, I am not a Christian. He said, I don't even believe in Jesus. He said, if Jesus existed at all, He's nothing more than another religious leader like Buddha or Muhammad or any of the other great religious geniuses. But I'm not a Christian and I don't see how God could come in flesh. And then he said, the second thing I want you to know about me is that I'm gay and that I'm going to love who I want to love. I'm going to be with who I want to be with. I'm going to live my life the way I want to live my life. I looked at my wife you know, Gina was saved when she was seven. Gina's daddy is 92 years old. He's still preaching every Sunday. Her daddy was a preacher. My mama was a prostitute. Gina grew up in a Baptist church. I grew up in a bar. Gina got saved at seven. Little girl in a revival at her daddy's church where her brother was leading the music. I got saved. I was 17. I was a drug addict, an alcoholic, locked up, looking at five years in the penitentiary in the Tarrant County jail cell. We came from two different worlds. She has served the Lord. She's the best Christian I've ever met in my life. But when I looked into her face, it looked like someone had taken their fist and hit her as hard as they could in the nose and tears were welling up and streaming down her face. And I looked across the table at my 13 year old son and I said, son, I want to tell you two things. Number one, you'll always be my boy and I'll always be your daddy. And it doesn't matter where you go or what you do or who you do it with. You're my son. I'll always love you. The door's always open. But number two, son, I'm afraid that the choices that you're talking about making are going to take you places where you really don't want to go. And for the next 10 years of our life, our life literally was turned upside down. By the time my son was 15 years old, he was living a full-blown gay lifestyle he began to experiment with drugs and then later became addicted. He was arrested. We had to put our son into a mental institution. He developed an eating disorder. He looked like a bag of bones. He was literally starving himself to death. I'd be out on the road preaching out in the middle of nowhere. And I'd wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning in a cold sweat, the devil somehow seeping into my dreams and I would see my son. I'd, I'd, I'd have a dream about walking into his bedroom and seeing him dangling from the end of a rope having taken his own life. Every time I passed a homeless person, the devil would laugh at me and say, that's your son. That's what I'm going to do to your son. I'm going to destroy your son. I'm going to destroy your wife. She's going to get bitter. And Gina, if she were here, would tell you that over the years, bitterness toward God began to creep in. We didn't understand. All 
I could do is get up at three in the morning and kneel down beside my bed and raise my hands and say, God, don't forget us. Don't forget my son. Lord, we've dedicated him to you. We've, we haven't been perfect parents, but we've tried to raise all of our children in the nurture and admonition of Jesus. And we never made our house about being a, min, a preacher's kid or being a ministry family. We always talked about Jesus and we tried to keep everything very real. Lord, don't forget that. Watch over our son. And sometimes Gina and I would just hold each other all night long and just cry and weep and pray, God, take care of our boy. Take care of our boy. And over the next 10 years, we saw our son drift further and further and further and further and further. He was so lost. Jesus tells a story about a man who had a hundred sheep. And one day, one of those little sheep, we don't really know why, we, we don't know all the details, but Jesus said that one little sheep, I, I, I think that probably one day as he was grazing with all the other sheep and, and he, he began to notice that some of the grass looked a little greener, so he started nibbling and nibbling and he looked over and thought he saw a greener grass and pretty soon he had nibbled his way and when he looked up, he was miles and miles away from the care of the shepherd and the rest of the sheepfold. The little sheep was lost. Jesus told a story about a lady who had been given a very expensive part of her dowry. It was a headpiece with 10 silver coins. This was part of the custom in that day. And probably she only wore it during special occasions. And one night, maybe she and her husband went out and she put that that headpiece on with those 10 silver coins, an expression of her father's love. And when they came in, maybe it was late at night, and instead of carefully taking the headpiece and folding it and putting it in its place, maybe she just kind of pitched it over to the side. And when she did, one of the coins was jostled from its place, hit the ground, rolled over into a dark corner, and it was lost. Then Jesus tells about a man who had two sons. He had an older son, and the older son always seemed to have his act together. Mr. Perfect always did the right thing, kept all the rules. You know the kind of, some of you have an older brother like that, amen. Always, yes sir, no sir, yes ma'am, no ma'am. They lived out since we're in Texas, in this part of Texas. Maybe his daddy had a big cattle ranch and he grew up on the ranch. He loved his dad. He, he wanted to be just like his dad, following his dad's footsteps. And everywhere his dad went, he went always, always trying to learn, trying to be obedient. He had a big plan for his life. When his dad retired, he was going to take over that big cattle ranch. That was the older boy. But he had an arrogance about him. Matter of fact, he, he, he walked with a kind of arrogance that let everybody know he's a little better than you are. He does things a little better than you do, and especially as it concerned his younger brother, because he had a younger brother who lived a little bit on the edge. He had a wild streak inside of him. Handsome young kid, charismatic young kid, but never seemed to be able to follow the rules, always coloring outside of the lines. He had absolutely no desire. He wasn't into cows. He had no desire to take over the ranch, even work at the ranch. He had big plans for his life. And so Jesus said that one day the boy, the younger son, came to his dad and said, Dad, I got a plan for my life. And me and some buddies have been dreaming, and, and we think that there's an opportunity out there for us. If, we, if I just had enough capital, I think, I, I think I'd make you proud of me, Dad, if I could just get some money together. And what I was wondering, Dad, is if I could have my inheritance now. And the dad probably looked at him, if you use your sanctified imagination, and said, Son, I don't think you're ready for that. I mean, you just graduated from high school and, and mom and I were talking and we know that this is not the future for you. We know you have dreams and plans and we want to support you. But what we were thinking is if you could hang around here, maybe go to the junior college and, and just be here and maybe help me out some and we'll save some money and we'll put something together so you can do everything that's in your heart. And the boy said, no, dad, I'm going to do it now with your blessing or without your blessing. 
everything, and the Father was a good, good Father. And so Jesus said that, that he got an inheritance together. Maybe he sold some cows, liquidated some assets, got the money, gave it to his son. And as the son was getting ready to walk out the door, the dad said, before you leave, I, I, I had some things for you. Son, I notice that you always look at my ring and you admire that ring. It has our family crest on it. My father had one and his father had one. And son, before you leave, I, I want you to know that I had one of these rings made for you. And I want you to wear it proudly. And every time you look at it, I want you to think about me and mom and the place here. And always know you can always come home, son. I want to give you this ring. And your mom went out and she picked out the best fabric she could find and she had a custom made coat for you, son. And, and we'd like to give you this coat kind of as a going away present. And when it's cold outside and you wrap it around yourself, always think about home. And, and I've noticed you always iron my, fo iron my footwear. You like my boots. And so I had some, some custom made boots for you, son. I want to give you these boots. So wherever you go and wherever you walk, you'll always be reminded of my love and that this place is your home. And before you leave, why don't you go in, mom's washing dishes after breakfast, and give your mama a kiss, and you know, you've always been her favorite, and just let her know that you love her. It would mean so much. And so the boy went in to his mom, gave her a kiss, took the ring, took the robe, took the shoes, walked outside, closed the door, got on his camel lack. Amen. Work with me. It's, it's, it's a got on his camel lack. And Jesus said that he headed out. He wanted to get as far away from his dad because their family was well known in the area. And he didn't want to live under the shadow of his daddy and his big brother and all their family had accomplished. He wanted to make it on his own. And so he went, Jesus said he went to another country where no one knew him, knew his name. And when that boy hit town, man, he hit town big. I can see him walking into the local watering hole. He had a fist full of money his dad just gave him, had a brand new custom coat, custom boots, big shiny ring, and he walked in that bar and said, hey, all the drinks are on me. And everybody said, man, who is that guy? And they started gathering around and the money was flowing and the booze was flowing and everything looked great. But Jesus said, suddenly, the economy of that country took a dip. How many of you know money talks? It says bye-bye, amen. The economy began to suffer, and the boy got to the end of his money. And, of course, when you get to the end of your money, you get to the end of your friends in a lot of cases. And he didn't have any more money, so he didn't have any more friends. And next month, his rent was due, and he looked at that coat and said, Well, you know, this is a nice coat, but i got to have some money to pay rent. And so he pawned the coat to pay rent, and the next time he began to be hungry and there was no groceries anymore and he looked at those shoes and said man I can't eat these shoes and so he sold his shoes so he could get some groceries and the last thing to go was the ring that his daddy had given him and because he was in a different country he couldn't speak the language and because he didn't study hard in school he couldn't get a good job and the only job he could find was a pig farmer who thought that it would be funny to have a Jewish young Young boy slopping his pigs. And so there he was, far away from home, no ring, no robe, no shoes, no food, no friends, slopping pigs for a Gentile pig farmer. And Jesus said one day he became so hungry he could smell the biscuits cooking in mama's oven and he could feel the warmth of his bedroom and the place that he grew up and the love of his family. He began to daydream. He was so hungry that he reached down and got a handful of the pig slop and he was about to put it in his mouth when the farmer went by and said, hey boy, put that food down. That's for my pigs. And then Jesus said all at once, he came to himself. And that's what I'm praying will happen to somebody in this room this morning. He came to himself. And he said, my dad's a big rancher. And my dad's got a lot of men that work for him. And my dad's a good man. He pays them a good wage. And he keeps them in a nice place. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get up out of this pig pen. And I'm going to go home to my daddy. 
And when I see my daddy, I'm going to say, Father, I have sinned against you. Everything you've ever taught me, everything you and mom ever tried to teach me, I thought I knew better, and I have sinned against you, and I've sinned against our God, the God who you've taught me about, who I went to church to learn about. I've sinned against you, and I've sinned against God, and I know I'm not worthy to be your son anymore, but dad, I'm starving to death. If I could just come home and live out in the bunkhouse with all the other guys, I won't even tell them what my last name is, but dad, could I please come home? And the Bible says the boy got up and he began to make his way home. And meanwhile, back at the ranch, I don't think there was a day that went by when that old man and his wife, before breakfast, wouldn't hold hands And say, God, you see our boy. You know everything, Lord. You know we raised our boy. Lord, let me remind you that your word says if you raise up a child in the way they should go, that when they're old, might take a while, but when they're old, they'll come back. They won't depart from it. And Lord, you see our son and you know where he is. And Lord, we're just praying that maybe today would be the day when you'll bring our boy back home And I think every morning after breakfast, that old man went out to the edge of his field, of his land, and cupped his hand over those old eyes, that hot Middle Eastern sun, and looked out through squinting eyes, hoping that that would be the day when his boy would come home day after day, and week after week, and month after month, until one day the old man went out to the corner of his land, and he looked up, and coming over the horizon, he looked, his eyes got big, and he said, man, I think that's my boy. He walked walks like my boy. He's a lot skinnier than he was when he left, but I think that's my boy. And then Jesus said that old Jewish man did something that no dignified man of his age would ever do. He girded up his his robe, and he began to run as fast as those old legs could take him toward that figure, his boy. And as he got closer, the boy saw him coming, and he must have been thinking in his mind, okay, I've got my little speech. What I'm going to say, have you ever gotten in trouble, and you knew you were going to get in trouble. So you had your little speech all worked out. Has that ever happened? And you knew what you're going to say. And so the dad came close and the boy started into his speech. Oh, Father, I have sinned against God and against you. But the father interrupted him mid-sentence and wrapped his arms around the neck of the boy and began to kiss him. And he said, hey, my boys, come home. Hey, bring him a ring. When he left, he had a ring. Get him another ring and bring some, a robe because when he left, he had a robe. Bring him a robe and put shoes on his feet and get the best cow in the pasture and kill it. Let's have a big Texas barbecue because this my son was dead and now he's alive. This my son was lost and now he is found. Amen. That is the gospel. That's the gospel. Amen. Somebody give God some praise in this place this morning. Woo! That's the gospel. What is Jesus trying to teach us in this story? He's trying to teach us that people are valuable. You know why that shepherd went after that sheep? Because that sheep, for whatever reason, now if it would have been me and you, we might have said, man, I got 99 more sheep. And besides all that, that little sheep was always wandering off. And you know what? He's going to get what he deserves. I got to take care of these 99. I don't care about that sheep, but not this shepherd. That, this shepherd left the 99 in the care of the under shepherds and at great risk to his own life. He went into the highways and the byways until he found that little sheep all matted up and he picked up that little sheep those shepherds had a name for every one of their sheep and that shepherd began to call that sheep by name and sing to him and carried on his shoulders all the way back to the safety of the sheepfold because that sheep was valuable to that shepherd amen Amen. that's what God's trying to say is every person in this room is value. You are of great worth. Maybe somebody told you where you were no good and you'd never mount to anything and your life would never be of any substance, but I'm telling you there's a God in heaven who says you're valuable to him. That coin was valuable. You know why that coin was valuable? The coin was valuable because imprinted on that coin, just like coins today, was the image of the king. And you're valuable not because of the color of your skin or because of what kind of car or truck you rolled 
rolled up in or how much money you've got in the bank or what kind of house you live in. That's not what makes you valuable. Those things can come and go. Amen. What makes you valuable is you've been created in the image of God himself and you bear his image in your being. Amen. The value of something is determined by the price that someone is willing to pay for. And God thought you were so valuable that he turned his pockets inside out. He bankrupt heaven. He didn't send an angel. He sent his only begotten son to die and hang like a piece of raw meat on a cross to let you know this is how valuable you are to me. Amen. <laughs> Young person, you're valuable. You're not valuable just because you're pretty or just because you're handsome, or just because you're athletic, or just because you're smart, or just because what your last name is, you are valuable. There is a God who says, listen to this, he said, what would it profit a man if he could gain the whole world? In other words, if you could get all the silver, all the gold, all the diamonds, all the oil, all the natural gas, all the wealth that could ever be accumulated and put it on this side of the room and then take the soul of one little African girl who lives in a village. She has no proper education. She doesn't even have shoes for her feet. But if you could take her soul, she'll never learn to read and write and never leave the perimeter of her village. But if you could put her soul on this side of the room and all the wealth of the world on this side of the room, Jesus said what's on this side of the room is more valuable than what's on that side of the room. Amen. You're valuable to God. That's what Jesus is trying to tell us, that people are valuable. But secondly, he's trying to tell us that people are lost. People are lost. That little sheep was lost because of its waywardness. It was wayward. And it wanted to go its own way. And that's why the Bible says, all we like sheep. Amen. That's not a compliment. Amen. Sheep are dumb and they're defenseless and they're directionless. And Jesus said, we like sheep. He said, all we like sheep, Isaiah said, have gone our own way. We've turned everyone to our own way. And just like sheep, see that little sheep, watch this, never intended to be lost. But that's how sin is. See, I've never met a prostitute who said when I was 13 years old, it was my goal in life to sell my body one day. No, it doesn't happen that way. I've never met a drug addict who said, you know, when I was 12 years old, I wanted to get to the point where I couldn't even go a day without shoving a needle in me. And it doesn't happen that way. Most people don't have blowouts. They have slow leaks. Amen. And they just start hanging out with the wrong crowd. You better be careful who you hang out with. You better be careful who you let shape your life. Don't you think you're above making choices that will have long-term detrimental impact on your life? You better be real careful. Listen, you can't soar with the eagles if you run with the turkeys. Amen? Be careful who you allow to shape your life. Most of the time, you will not pull them up. They will pull you down. And you better make sure that if you date somebody, girls, I'm talking to you today. Because I've seen too many church girls grow up in church, get pregnant before they get out of high school, and be in a situation for years and years and years that almost destroys their life. I'm trying to help you. Come on, Daddy. Amen. I'm trying to do what some of you dads don't have the courage to do. Some of you got macaroni for a backbone and pablum for brains. And you're just going to sit around and watch television and let your kids destroy their lives. God help us. I'm trying to help you. Matter of fact, if you date anybody at all, and probably most of you don't, you, you just, just need to tell God, you, you know, I'm not interested in you, these high school guys. Because they don't really love you. You understand that, don't you? They love themselves. And what they mean is not I love you. What they mean is I lust you. What they mean is I want to use you. What they mean is I want to put my hands all over your body. They don't mean I love you. They mean I lust you. That's why you should never date anybody that doesn't love Jesus with all their heart. Matter of fact, you should never date anybody who does not love and respect and value you, who will not open the door for you, who will not treat you right, who will not pray with you, who would never dare to violate you or abuse you or use you. Matter of fact, you ought to, 
on every date you ever go on, you ought to get a big old Bible. I'm talking about a big old honking Bible, like Grandma has on her coffee table. You know those big 250-pound weightlifter edition of the Bible filled with pictures of naked angels? You know what I'm saying? I mean, one of those big old family Bibles. Take it on every date you ever go on. Put it right between you and your boyfriend. By the time that rascal climbs over Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he'll be too tired to mess with you. Amen. Come on, somebody help me out. Amen. But not this, this guy. See, what this guy said, he started listening to his friends. He started rolling his eyes at his mom and dad. He started thinking, my parents don't know anything. My parents are stupid. My, my friends know what's best for me. And pretty soon, you see, that's what sin does. It fascinates you and then assassinates you. It thrills you and then it kills you. Amen. Sin will take you further than you ever thought you'd go, make you stay longer than you ever thought you'd stay, and make you pay more than you ever thought you'd pay. And it wasn't long until this little wayward sheep was completely and totally, say the word, lost lost. The coin got lost because of carelessness. The coin got lost because the young girl came in and instead of folding the coin up and putting it in its place, she pitched it to the side and the silver coin was jostled from its place and it rolled over into the side in a dark corner, a dusty corner, and it was lost because of carelessness. Now you listen to me. I don't have to tell you how many young people, how many people in America are lost because of our carelessness as a church. Because we have mishandled them. Because when they came to our churches, instead of loving them and embracing them and welcoming them because they looked a certain way or because they were tatted up or because they were gay or because they weren't the right color, instead of celebrating them and welcoming them and throwing a party to welcome them into the family of God, we have neglected them and mishandled them. Do you know one out of four young people today say, I don't want anything to do with the church? They, ch they checked the, mark, the, the box that said none, none. What is your religious preference? When I got saved in 1980, listen to this, it was 6% of Americans that would say, I don't have any religious preference today. It is over 25% of young people who are saying, I'm not interested in your political Jesus. I'm not interested in your right-wing Jesus. I'm not interested in your American Jesus. I'm not interested in your bigoted Jesus. I'm not interested in your homophobic Jesus. They want a Jesus that loves them, that is real, that says, I value you. And may this church, the Jesus house, may it be a place where whatever we have to do, we will love and embrace and welcome and celebrate every person that walks through those doors. Amen. Amen. How, don't you dare call yourself a Methodist if you don't love everybody that walks in these doors. John Wesley reached out and loved everybody, and you know what they did? The Anglican church picked up tomatoes in the marketplace and threw them at him because he was willing to go to the coal miners in Wales. And all the Anglican churches said, those people are dirty and nasty, and we don't want them in our churches. And John Wesley said, well, Jesus wants them in heaven. And so he went out to the coal miners with his brother Charles, who wrote new hymns that nobody had ever sung, but they didn't have a hymn book back then. Charles Wesley was writing those hymns. They were contemporary Christian music. And Wesley wrote the hymns that talked about the love of God. And can it be that God would love me like this? And Wesley and Whitfield stood in the power of the Holy Ghost, and they preached to those coal miners until the streaks, until tears made streaks down their blackened faces as they wept their way to Jesus. That's Methodism. Amen. That's Methodism. Jesus is trying to tell us that people are valuable, that people are lost. You know why the boy was lost? He was lost because of his own rebelliousness. Because he came to the point in his life, he said, I don't have to listen to my old man. I had a kid like that in my youth group when I was a youth pastor. He came up to me one day, I'll never forget it. He said, he said, you know what, Pastor Scott? He said, man, my old man, he called his dad his old man. 
He said, my old man and my mom, they're not going to tell me what to do anymore. And my coach is not going to tell me what to do. And the school principal's not going to tell me. Then he put his finger in my face and he said, you're not going to tell me what to do. Nobody's going to tell me what to do anymore because in the morning I'm leaving home and I'm going to go join the army. I said, dude, your cheese has done slid off your cracker. Amen. That's all they're going to do. And that young man began to hang out with his buddies. And pretty soon he was living a double life at first. He, oh, he'd come to church because his parents made him come to church. But through the school day, oh, you would have never thought he was a church guy at all. Because he was living a double life. But then as soon as he got old enough to be out on his own, he said, bye, bye. He said to his dad, as far as I'm concerned, you're dead and I want my inheritance right now. And his own rebelliousness caused him to be lost. Jesus is saying people are valuable, people are lost, let me finish. But he was also saying people can be found. And that's the good news, amen? Amen. The shepherd went and he searched and the word until is in the text. He searched and searched until. Everybody say the word until. Until. Say it again. Until. We got to go after the lost until we find them. Amen. So that shepherd went out and he found that little sheep. And that's when the joy, that's when the, the party started. He said, rejoice with me. And then Jesus said, I tell you, there's more joy over one sinner that repents than over 99 self-righteous church people, scabs and parasites, scribes and Pharisees who feel like they need no repentance. You know why the scribes and Pharisees didn't like Jesus? Because he was always hanging out with sinners. Amen. He was always hanging out with sinners. Sinners say, hey, come over to our our house. Let's have a party. And Jesus said, what time does it start? And he'd show up there. Jesus went everywhere seeking and saving those who were lost. Amen. And Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you the same kind of person. If you're not after the lost, then you're not following Jesus. People can be found. The coin was found. The Bible says the the lady got a broom and she did something evidently she hadn't done in a long time. She cleaned her house, amen. And she started sweeping and sweeping and sweeping and she swept and she searched and she looked until she found that coin that was lost. And the boy came home. I got a call one day from my son, Dylan. He was locked up for the second time, arrested in the same place by the same police officer for the same crime. Sin makes you stupid. Amen. He said, Dad, I'm back in jail. Can you come get me out? And the Holy Spirit of God, like I'm speaking to you, spoke to me and said, no, don't you go get him this time. You leave him right there. I'm working on him. You know why some of our kids never get out of the pig pen? Because we keep bailing them out. And the Holy Spirit of God said, just leave him right there. And I called Gina and I said, Dylan's back in jail. And she said, are you going to go get him? And I said, I can't. The Holy Spirit said to just leave him there. And she said, are you sure? And I said, I'm sure. I want to go get him. Everything in my heart wanted to go get my boy. I've been in that place. I don't want my son to be in there. But the Holy Spirit of God said, I'm working on him. And a few days later, Dylan called me and he said, Dad, I got into a program and I've been bailed out. He said, could you come by and get me? And I said, I'm not far from you right now. Matter of fact, it's me and mom and Madison and Josh. And Maddie was about 13 and Josh was about 16, 17. And I said, we're on our way to our favorite restaurant. I'm sure you hadn't had anything good to eat in a while. I said, we'll swing by and we'll pick you up and we'll all go eat together. And I said, I love you, son. When I stopped by, Dylan got in the car and never said a word. We drove all the way to the restaurant. We went inside, favorite restaurant. Dylan said, I'm not hungry. My son Dylan has always been very stoic and very hard and very stubborn and very non-responsive and very non-emotional. So he was sitting there and we ordered our food. We were just small talking and I looked across the table and big tears were rolling down my son's cheeks. The restaurant was full of people. 
And my son started sobbing. You know those kind of sobs when your shoulders start shaking and you just bury your hand and your, 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 your face in your hands and you're just sobbing? My son started sobbing. And then he said, Dad, he said, I'm so lost. He said, Dad, I thought that you and Mom were so stupid and Christianity was so stupid. I looked over at Gina and she was just weeping and she was praying. And I looked at Maddie and Maddie was just, I mean, she was praying. And I looked at Josh and he was praying. And he said, but Dad, I'm so lost. And he said, I need God. I need God in my life. And the Holy Spirit gave me a word of wisdom. If you don't know what that is, come to the study of the book of Acts and you'll find out. The Holy Spirit showed me something I could have ever, never known unless he showed it. And I said, son, can you say the words, Jesus is Lord? He could not get the words out of his mouth. And I said, son, have you been involved in the occult? Are you involved in witchcraft and the occult? And he started shaking his head, yes. I said, would you be willing to go to your place and get all that junk? I said, do you have stuff in your place right now that's occultic? He said, yes. I said, would you be willing to go and get it out so you could be free? And he said, I want to go right now, Dad. And I asked for the bill. We never touched our food. I signed the bill. We walked out, got in the, got, got in the car, drove to his place. My little girl, Maddie, she's a world changer. She was 13 years old at the time. She was the first one out the door. She said, I ain't afraid of no devil. Amen. And she walked up, got two big grass bags full of those black, you know, bags. She walked into where he was at. They filled up two of those bags full of all kinds of sorcery and witchcraft and skulls and demonic stuff. And they put him out to the curb. My son Dylan fell to his knees, lifted his hands, said, Jesus is Lord. Got on his feet and has never been the same. And that was six years ago because Jesus is in the lost and found business. Amen. People are valuable. People are lost. But thank God, people can be found. I want every head to be bowed, every eye to be closed. Is there anybody in this room that has a prodigal son, a prodigal daughter, a prodigal husband? I had a prodigal mama. You know, my mama was an alcoholic. She was a prostitute. I got to lead my mama to Jesus five years before she got cancer and went home to heaven. Some of you have a prodigal son, a prodigal daughter, a prodigal mom, a prodigal dad, a prodigal husband, a prodigal wife, a prodigal friend, somebody that's wasting their life and it bothers you and burdens you. Is there anybody in here that has a prodigal in their life? Let me see your hand. Let me see your hand. Let me see. I want everybody whose hands is raised to get up out of your seat. Let's come to the altar right now. Come on, right now. Come on together right now. All of us together. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Hey, everybody with a problem. Let's just kneel here. Don't let them kneel alone. If you see a friend come and get up out of your seat and come pray with them and for them right now. I need all my prayer warriors to get up and come find somebody that you can kneel around that you can begin to pray for and minister to. Come on right now. Come on right now. Come on right now. Just kneel around them and let them know I'm praying with you. I'm praying for you. I've been there. The Lord's going to help you. The Lord's going to help you. Then I don't want to assume that everybody in this room really knows Jesus. I think it's been wonderful over the last few months. We've seen over a hundred first-time professions of faith. And many, many, many people have been baptized. And we're going to baptize people every week. And celebrate together a sinner coming home. But what about you? Do you feel like you're in a far country? Maybe in a pig pen of your own making. And if you were honest and if you would swallow your pride... You'd have to say, man, I'm lost. I'm lost. I thought I knew. I thought I had it together. I thought I knew what was going on. But man, I'm lost. And I need the Lord. Is that you? Is that you? You might not be down and out. You might be up and out. 
You might have a lot of money in the bank and a big house, but there's no home in your house. And on the inside, you feel so empty and so lost. Today is your day to come home. In a moment, I'm going to voice a prayer for everybody in the room who feels like they're lost, but you want to come home. And if that's you, I want you to voice a simple prayer to God. You're not saved by repeating a prayer. You're saved by Jesus who loves you and died for you and rose from the dead. But when you pray, you're talking to Jesus. And he's listening to you right now. When that boy came to himself and said, I'm going to get up and go home, that's where the change took place. And when he got up and went home, the dad was there. God's not against you, man. Quit listening to the devil tell you God is against you. God's not. What more could he do? He gave his only son. What else can he do? The ball's in your court. You got to decide. Are you sick and tired of being sick and tired? Are you ready to come home? If you are, pray with me right now. Matter of fact, I want everybody in the room to pray this prayer out loud. Just say, Jesus, thank you for loving me even though I'm lost. Lord, I need you. Thank you that when you see me, you see value and you're not against me. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross so that I could be forgiven. I believe you've risen from the dead and overcome death so that I could have a new life. And Jesus, the best I know how, I'm gonna get up out of the pig pen and I'm coming home. Jesus, thank you for your open arms to receive me into your family. Save me today. Change me today. I really mean it in Jesus' name. Now heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Christians are praying. Is there anybody here that prayed that simple prayer with me? Is there anybody? Is that you? Come here. Come here, buddy. Is there anybody else? If it's you, get up and come. Come on. How about in the back? Did you pray with me? If you did, get up and come. Don't be ashamed. Just get up and come. Is there anybody else? Anybody else that prayed with me today? Jeremy, let's talk to these. Yes, amen. Let's talk to these young people. All right? Come on, sing. Sing, I am redeemed. I am redeemed. Anybody else? Oh, yeah, here she comes. Amen. Here they come. God bless you. I love you. God. So I'll Amen. shake off these heavy chains. Amen. Wipe away every stain. Tracy. Okay, Abby. Yeah, let's go that way. God bless you, sweetheart. Just cry that mascara off. That's all right. That's all right. Anybody else? Come. Anybody else? Let's all stand together, church. Come on, sing it. Come on, sing it. Let's sing it in faith for our prodigals. God's going to save our kids. He's going to save our grandkids. Come on, church. God, save our kids. Bring our prodigals home. In Jesus' name. So I'll shake off these heavy chains Wipe away every stain But I'm not who I used to be Oh, I don't have to be The old man inside of me But his day is long dead and gone Cause I've got a new name A new life, I'm not the same And I hope I want to lift up our prodigal sons and daughters. Lord, I thank you that you see them right now. And you love them even more than we could love our own children. You love them even more. And Father, I thank you that the game is not over. It's not even halftime yet. And Lord, you are working. You are hearing our prayers. Come on, church, pray with me. You are hearing our prayers right now, Lord. 
And Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are the omnipresent God. Our kids can run, but they can't hide. And you know right where they are, and you know every Bible lesson they've ever heard, every prayer at meals, every song they ever sang, everything they ever learned in Sunday school. And that seed is deep in their hearts, Lord, and they can't get away from it in Jesus' name. Lord, as we're faithful to tell somebody else's son about you, may you send someone to our son. May you send someone to our daughter. Lord, I pray prodigal husbands and prodigal wives and prodigal grandchildren and sons and daughters would come home, Lord. I pray before the end of the year that in this place, right in this Jesus house, that we would see many of our sons and daughters come to you. Do it, Lord, for your glory. And Lord, we will join the angels and rejoice because one sinner has come home in Jesus' name. And everybody said, hey, we had about five people that came to give their life to Christ. Let's join the angels right now. Amen. Amen. Woo! Praise God. Church, I love you. And uh, what a time we're going to have. We got a lot of stuff going on. So get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. Like my friend T.D. Jake says, get ready, get ready, get ready. Because God's going to do some great stuff. I love you. We're going to sing a song and we're going to take the light of Jesus right out of the worship center and into the world. Then I want to pray a blessing over you. And then we'll be dismissed, all right? If you can stand to leave this place, the Spirit of God is here. I think so. Do we have baptisms? I didn't know. Well, if we're doing that, let's go outside in a minute. Not right now, but in a minute. And we'll gather around and see some folks get dunked. Amen. Or get sprinkled or poured or whatever they want to do. Let's sing, Kent. Come on, guys. I am redeemed. You said. Let's sing Jesus is the answer, all right? Let's sing that. That's our anthem. Sing it. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there's no other. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the answer. And now may the love of God the Father and the joy of knowing Jesus and the peace of the Holy Spirit that passeth all understanding guard your hearts and your minds and may you be filled fresh with the Spirit and may you go tell in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Hug a hundred necks and you're dismissed. I love you, church. God bless you. Thank you for being here today.